Next Saturday afternoon's broadcast is Wagner's De Meistersinger. And that music drama, by his own admission, Father Owen Lee says is his favorite opera in the entire repertory. So for our third intermission this afternoon, Father Lee will present the first part of a two-part discussion of Wagner and De Meistersinger, which will be concluded during the first intermission of next Saturday's broadcast. Father Lee. Thank you, Peter Allen. How can we start talking about Wagner when Verdi's wonderful music, O Sommo Carlo, is still ringing in our ears? And about Wagner's Meistersinger, that most German of operas? Well, I'll start with Verdi's Italian word Sommo, highest, a superlative. To say anything about next week's opera requires a superlative of some sort, and I'm glad Verdi has just provided one for me. De Meistersinger is, to use one superlative, the longest opera in the standard repertory, at least according to the Guinness Book of Records, where Reginald Goodall's performance clocks in at five hours and 15 minutes. And the overture to Meistersinger has been, through the years, the most often performed piece of music in North American concert halls, number one on the classical top 40, at least according to annual trade figures from BMI. Meister Singer can also lay claim to having, quote, the greatest libretto ever written, at least according to Patrick Smith, author of that authoritative study of librettos, The Tenth Muse. But many Wagnerites at Bayreuth will use a superlative from the other end of the scale. They say it is the least of all the master's works, too diatonic or even too shallow or otherwise uncharacteristic of the master. Accordingly, with those whom we may call non-Wagnerites, Meistersinger is often cited as Wagner's one relatively healthy product, a sort of anomalous accident, and quite the superlative, most acceptable of his works. Finally, there are those of us who, when pressed, would use a more personal sort of superlative, favorite. We would give Meistersinger pride of place in any roll call of works for the musical stage. And we're not all of us Germans. Among our number, the Englishman John Culshaw, who spoke so eloquently on these broadcasts, and the Italian Arturo Toscanini, who wanted to lay his baton down finally only after conducting Meistersinger, and the Polish patriot, composer, and pianist Paderewski, who cited Meistersinger as the greatest work of genius ever achieved by any artist in any field. Well, superlative it may be, but the work had pretty humble beginnings. The idea of writing it first came to Wagner when he was a young man in the summer of 1845. On his doctor's advice, he took a cure at Marienbad, the famous spa in Bohemia. He was under orders to do no writing. The weather was glorious, and he had a good book to read by Wolfram von Eschenbach, who was a character in the opera he had just put on the stage, Tannhäuser. Wolfram would make nice, relaxing reading in the woods and by the streams. But, as almost anyone could confidently predict, Wagner got all excited when he started to read Wolfram's epic, Parsifal, and the related legend of Parsifal's son, Lohengrin. Two potential operas started welling up in Wagner so urgently that, to distract himself, he turned to another book on the history of German literature. And before long, he was drafting out of that a third potential opera, just a little thing, really, about the old master singers of Nuremberg. Only a comedy, so his doctor couldn't really object to his writing it down, could he? Besides, it would put all of Wolfram's romantic knights, those Parsifals and Lohengrins, out of his head for a while. Well, Wagner was settling into his bath at Marienbad one afternoon when Wolfram's knights came back with a vengeance. And, as he records... He jumped out of the bath and hardly stopped to pull on his clothes before he got back to his room. The text of Lohengrin had to be got down on paper. Then, as his doctor gave up on him, the music of the love duet of Lohengrin started to form in the margin of the text. After that, through Lohengrin and revolution and flight and political exile and endless prose writings and heaven knows how many stormy love affairs, Wagner wrote Rheingold and Valkyrie and most of Siegfried and all of Tristan und Isolde, and finally 
Almost 20 years after the idea first came to him, he produced De Meister Singer. All along it had been growing within him from a tiny little sketch to the mightiest of his operas. He wrote the text in Paris, where, as always, his rejection and disappointment filled him with an intense longing for all things German, the art of Dürer, the tales of Hoffmann, the winding streets of old Nuremberg, and the cobbler poet Hans Sachs, who lived there. The story shaped itself almost like a fairy tale. A knight in shining armor comes to Nuremberg to rescue a maiden in distress, not with a sword, but with a song. The maiden's father, who loves music with all his heart, has rather unwisely put her up as the prize in a singing competition, and it looks like she's going to be carried off by a ridiculous dragon of a fellow named Beckmesser. But with only one day to go, our knight, with Hans Socks to help him, defeats that dragon and rescues that maiden. It's a comedy, all right, but I don't think it's been remarked how very much in the mainstream of comedy it is. If you've ever seen a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, you may know that our comic tradition in the West goes back 22 centuries to the Roman comedians Plautus and Terence, and even 24 centuries to the Athenian Menander, and what was called in the 4th century B.C. New Comedy. And in all of those old comedies, we meet, in play after play, these characters. The Adolescanes, the inexperienced young hero, who has only till morning to win his girl, and who is lectured at from all sides. That's Wagner's young knight, Walter. The service, the, in, the experienced slave who does most of the lecturing but gets into a lot of trouble himself. That's Wagner's apprentice, David. The Puella, the girl who is going to be given away in the morning. That's Wagner's Eva. The Nutrix, the confidant who tries to help the boy get the girl. Wagner calls her Magdalena. The Sanex, a philosophizing older man often secretly in love with the girl himself, and that, in De Meistersinger, is the central figure, Hans Sachs. Then there's the Leno, the procurer, who puts the girl up for sale. Well, he is considerably softened in Wagner. He's Eva's music-loving father. And finally, there is the ridiculously overconfident braggart soldier who hopes to get the girl in the morning, the Miles Gloriosus, whom Shakespeare used as a model for Falstaff, but who appears even more visibly as Wagner's Beckmesser. I mention all this not just because I'm a professor of classics or to imply that Wagner's comedy is unduly derivative, but to place De Meistersinger where it deserves to be placed in the great comic tradition of the West, from Greek Menander to the Romans, to Renaissance Italy, to Lope de Vega, Shakespeare and the Tempest, Moliere and Scapin, and Beaumarchais, Mozart and Rossini in the Figaro plays. Of all of those post-classical works, the characters in De Meistersinger are, I think, truest to classic type. And yet, mirabile dictu, they seem perfectly at home, transferred to medieval Germany. I suspect Wagner availed himself of the most traditional of plots with the most typical of characters because he wanted a solid base for what was going to be, on one level, an autobiographical manifesto. In his opera, Wagner casts himself as the young knight, Walter. And the master singers who oppose Walter are clearly the critics who had opposed Wagner for some 30 years. And Beckmesser, called Hans Lich, in an early draft of the libretto, is beyond much doubt the Viennese music critic Edward Hanslick. And that central figure, Hans Sachs, he seems to represent the whole German tradition in art and music, the historical Hans Sachs first, but also Luther and Bach and Goethe and all the great figures to Beethoven. In the course of his opera, Wagner uses Hans Sachs to show that German tradition marveling at and fighting for Wagner's music as a new and true expression of the best in the past. It's more complicated than that, of course, because Hans Sachs often speaks for the mature Wagner, too. 
One of the many astonishing things about De Meister Singer is how the little Greek and Roman plot blossoms in Wagner's shaping imagination into a dramatic structure of cathedralesque proportions. And the music? Oh, that blossoms too. It is my finest work, Wagner said as he composed. I weep and I laugh over it. He worked at it with the song-filled quickness of a Mozart, a Schubert. He found a dedicated young man named Hans Richter, a horn player in the Vienna Opera Orchestra, who was willing to live with him and his family on Lake Lucerne. Later, of course, Richter was, be was to become a famous conductor. And in a room over Wagner's, Richter copied sheet after sheet of the immense score as it was passed up to him. And he wondered. Wagner was scoring for virtually the same orchestra as Beethoven had in the Fifth Symphony, with only three additional brass players and a harp added. Yet how wondrously new was the orchestral effect, altogether different from Lohengrin's silver-blue beauty and the rings sounding rivers and trees and Tristan's feverish, surging chromaticism. Here, all was a rich, mellow, C major ripeness, old and new, effortlessly combined. Liszt played through the entire piano score in a single evening, exclaiming over and over on its beauty. Hans von Bülow, preparing for the first performance, wrote to a friend, you cannot begin to imagine its wealth of music, the Cellini workmanship in every detail. Wagner is the greatest composer, the equal of Beethoven and Bach, and more besides. We can understand that enthusiasm. They were watching the creation of a great work of art, and there's nothing so thrilling as that. Is there anything so thrilling on Broadway today as the scene in Sunday in the Park with George, where before our very eyes, the pointillist painter Georges Seurat creates his masterpiece, La Grande Jatte. It's a magic moment in the theater, but no more magical than the corresponding moment in Wagner's opera when, in his workshop, Hans Sachs helps Walter create, out of the memory of a dream, a master song as we watch and listen. We're about four hours into the opera by that time, and we're just beginning to sense something really wonderful about it, something Alfred Lorenz first pointed out, and Boris Goldovsky once explained during one of these intermissions. We feel instinctively that every note, every bar of this great work is exactly in place. And why do we feel that? Because we've been told by Sachs and David and by the master singers themselves, that when you're composing a master song, there have to be two stanzas, two stolen, of identical length, each with the same melody and with a rhyme at the end. And then, as a kind of resolution, there has to be an after song, an abgesang, as long as the two stolen together, with a wholly new melody. Through Acts 1 and 2 and the first part of Act 3, we've heard several attempts at this, from Walter and David and Beckmesser, and now it's becoming increasingly clear to our amazement that Act 1 and Act 2 are approximately the same length, and that there are a dozen or so incidents and even some bits of dialogue in Act 1 that are paralleled in Act 2, and that each act ends with a sort of rhyme in the story, public rioting over what is judged bad singing. In other words, Acts 1 and 2 are too stolen, and Act 3 is an abgazon as long as Acts 1 and 2 together with a new strain of seriousness and a harmonious resolution. The whole opera is one immense master song. The whole of Meistersinger, shaping itself before our very ears, is Wagner's answer to his critics, a song offered them to meet their specifications, filled with all the things they demanded from and found wanting in his other work. Diatonic structures, counterpoint, singable tunes, ensembles, folk dances worthy of Weber, and chorales worthy of Bach, and above all, thoroughly human characters. And there, with human characters, I'll make my final observation today. What moves me most about this opera is the humanity of Hans Sachs. He is, in fact, a model for me. He is an educator who teaches not just rules and techniques, but how to think and how to feel. He loves music as much as he loves his chosen profession, and he sees the connection between the two. 
He is a celibate whose true children are those whose lives he touches and enriches. He is the good man I would like to be, helping Walter shape his intuitive inspirations, guiding Ava generously in her unfolding love for Walter, teaching David his trade and at the same time opening him up to wider issues, opposing Beckmesser because Beckmesser can destroy the happiness of the others, and besides, Beckmesser has a lot to learn. But Socks, like all the great characters in opera, Socks also learns. He comes to see deeply into life, to accept its inevitable limitations, and to embrace it fully. He is a character that a man, when he doubts and fails and prays and wonders, can want to identify with and grow with. At the end of a performance of De Meistersinger, we in the audience are proud to the point of cheering that humankind can triumph over its tragic flaws and produce out of its sorrows great laughing works of art. I can remember leaving performances of other Wagner operas walking on air and turned wonderingly inward. But after De Meistersinger, filled with at least as much emotion, I'm turned outwards. I want to embrace all the world. As I left the theater, Munich or Zurich, London or New York seemed transformed. And not just by some midsummer moon or midwinter snow. There was something essentially right with the world. Life made sense. It was, in fact, brim full of meaning, and I was eager to live it. That's what great art can mean. Maybe that's why people speak of De Meistersinger in superlatives. Thank you, Father Lee. Mission feature this afternoon, Opera News on the Air, Father Owen Lee, professor of classics at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, will conclude his discussion of Wagner's De Meistersinger, which he began last week, and will illustrate his remarks with musical excerpts on the Baldwin. Father Lee. Thank you, Peter Allen. When I was a boy and went to the movies, there'd often be a big storybook up there on the screen, and some unseen hand would pull it open, and the pages would start turning by themselves, and then I'd be swept into the story. Well, that's what today's opera is for me. It's a big, illuminated manuscript, a massive medieval songbook, with secular and sacred melodies jostling each other page on page for hundreds and hundreds of pages. Some unseen hand pulls it open at the first chord of the overture, and then the pages turn of themselves, and the melodies pour out in wondrous profusion and the irresistible onward movement through those pages keeps me breathless till the last page echoes the first. I use a metaphor to describe De Meistersinger because De Meistersinger itself is full of metaphors. Just about everything in it, large and small, is or means something else. And one of the pleasures of hearing it again and again is the thrill of discovering what else and what else and what else it all means. The moment the curtain rises on the last chord of the overture, the metaphors begin to work. The people of Nuremberg are in church, just finishing a vesper hymn to John the Baptist. Once our Savior came to thee, by thy hand baptized to be. They sing in the style of a Lutheran chorale, but did you notice? Their sacred song is a musical variant of the secular theme of the master singers. This is the master singer tune that opens the opera. Take two quarter notes out of that, make appropriate changes in timing and harmony, and you get the Vesper Hymn. So, right from the start, it's fairly clear that in this opera, the sacred will be a metaphor for the secular. The entire action takes place on the eve and feast of a saint, the saint to whom the Savior himself came for baptism. But why that day? 
Well, first, St. John's Day, Johannistag, June 24th, is a Christian feast superimposed on the old pagan observance of the summer solstice. On the eve of that midsummer day, evil spirits were thought to fare abroad and make men mad. Then St. John would send good spirits in the morning. It's the perfect day for Wagner's story. For both Acts 1 and 2 of De Meistersinger on the night before end with bursts of midsummer madness, or as Hans Sachs calls it, Vaughn. Evil spirits are at work, like glowworms in the dark. And then, on the morning after, in Act 3, a song comes out of a midsummer night's dream that banishes the evil spirits, the poltergeister, and in Hans Sachs's words, conjures up good spirits, Gutegeister. And there's another reason for using John the Baptist's day. That day gave us the very fundament of our music. The notes of our scale, ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, ut, weren't after all named by Julie Andrews or Mary Martin. They are the opening syllables of each successive line of the old Latin hymn sung for centuries on John the Baptist's Eve. And when Wagner starts his story, he has his townsfolk sing a German version of that hymn to the Baptist that first gave us the notes of our scale. He wants us to know that in De Meistersinger, baptism will be a metaphor for music. And he fills his John the Baptist opera with scales. From the opening motif, <laughs> to this statement of the rules for songwriting. Now more about metaphor. If you radio listeners are following along with librettos, you must have noticed in Act One all those references to songbirds. Walter is told he must learn such master singer tones as the goldfinch, the lark, and the pelican, but he has his own kind of song. He learned it from an age-old Walter, the famous Walter van der Vogelweide, that is to say, Walter of the bird meadow. He's also learned his song from the meadow birds themselves. So he's impatient with the masters though they bear such names as Nachtigall, Nightingale, and Vogelgesang, bird song, and even the one who's sick and can't be there is named Niklaus Vogel, Nicholas the Bird. Walter likens himself to a bird that soars above such owls, rooks, magpies, and crows. No wonder the masters reject him. They know something about metaphor, too. And so the bird references continue to the last scene when all of Nuremberg rises to greet Hans Sachs with the chorale, Wach auf, awake, a nightingale is heralding a new dawn. The historical Sachs wrote those words in the 16th century. Here is Wagner's musical setting. Listen to how the soprano and bass lines move upwards and downwards along the scale. The historical Sox had Martin Luther in mind when he wrote about that nightingale. But such is the cumulative richness of association in the opera that when we hear the words in Act 3, we think, yes, the nightingale in the words is Luther, but Wagner makes the music sound like Bach, and the scales remind me of John the Baptist. And the people clearly intend the nightingale to represent Hans Sox. And Hans Sachs himself probably thinks by now that the nightingale is really Walter. And all of us who know the opera think at this point, 
Oh, the nightingale is surely Wagner. Such are the uses of metaphor. Another pattern. All through the text there are references to shoes and boots, wax and pitch, leather and last. Young David clues us in to what all this means metaphorically when he says, shoemaking and song making, I'm learning both together. In die Meistersinger, shoes are songs. In the acts to come, you'll see that metaphor working in these situations. Socks hammers away at Beckmesser's shoes whenever he finds a fault in his song. Ava comes to Socks insisting that her shoes pinch, but what she really wants is not a well-made shoe, but a well-made song for Walter to win the contest with. And while Socks is busy working on the shoe, Walter appears in the doorway to sing the song. At the contest, Beckmesser, limping in his new shoes and unsure of his footing on the platform, attempts to fit the words of Walter's song to his own tune with laughable results. Neither the shoe nor the song fits. Now, have you noticed? Through his baptism and bird and shoe metaphors, Wagner is suggesting a whole aesthetic, a philosophy of art. Art has a kind of sacramental power. Art is also an extension of nature. And practically speaking, art is the right way of making something. Schopenhauer may have said the first, and Epicurus the second, and Aquinas the third, but none of them said it so imaginatively as Wagner. Are you ready now to go deeper? John the Baptist, who presides over this opera, is a figure for Hans Sachs. That will become clear in Act Three. When David sings, John the Baptist on the Jordan is Johannes, but here in Germany we call him Hans. Hans, why, master, and he turns to Socks, today is your day, too. After that, the identification of St. John and Cobbler John really takes hold. Socks actually baptizes Walter's newborn song, and the redemptive power of the baptized song goes to work instantly. It changes the lives of all five characters who sing the famous quintet. And eventually, on the riverbank in the last scene, it affects all of Nuremberg. We're sure by then that St. John is a figure for Cobbler John. But you know, we might have spotted that the moment the curtain went up on Act One, from that all-important Vesper hymn, where the people sing to John the Baptist, Once our Savior came to thee, by thy hand baptized to be. Baptist, teacher, Christ's first preacher, take us by the hand, there on Jordan's strand. On the surface, all this is conventional piety appropriate to Reformation Germany. But in the overall context of the opera, it works metaphorically too. It is a prayer that Walter may come to Socks and be baptized, and that Socks may teach his people and raise them up on a German strand to a true appreciation of a New Testament of song. That prayer at the beginning of the opera is answered, metaphorically, at the opera's end. If Zox is John the Baptist, who, metaphorically, are the others? Their names will tell you. They are named for famous figures in the Bible who need redeeming, like King David and like Mary Magdalene, David and Magdalena yearn for redemption from a long apprenticeship so they can marry at last. And like Eve, Eva must be saved from Beckmesser, the devil of this piece, surely. His shoes are finished with pitch, not wax. And he himself exclaims, Zum Teufel, the devil, at every turn. Wagner doesn't press all this as far as he might have. He doesn't name his young hero Jesus. After all, we're in a shoemaking context. And the Bible's John said of Jesus, the strap of his sandal I am not worthy to lose. Instead, Wagner associates his hero with that forerunner of Jesus, Adam. That's quite clear in Act Two. Walter and Eva plan to elope, and Socks tries to stop them with a song, and Beckmesser comes along too with a song. And what does Socks sing? 
When Adam and Eve fled from paradise, lest they hurt their feet on the gravel outside, God told an angel to make them shoes before the devil turned cobbler. What does that song mean, Walter asks in the shadows. And Ava, who knows something about metaphor, says it's about us. It is, if you think of Walter as Adam, Ava as Eve, Beckmesser as the devil, and Socks as the angel barring, barring the way in and out of paradise, and if you're aware that in this opera, shoes also mean song. Above all, when we come to Act Three, listen to the words of the various drafts of our Adam's prize song. At first, the song is sacred in subject, drawn from the first pages of the Bible, a morning of wonderful light, a garden, a tree, a woman offering its fruit. Walter eventually says it right out. This is Eve in the Garden of Paradise, Eva in Paradise. Then the song becomes secular, about art, an evening where the urge to create is irresistible, a laurel tree, a woman peering through the branches. Walter eventually says, quite directly, this is the muse of Parnassus, the Musa des Parnas, religion and art, those co-metaphors in Die Meistersinger. Poor baffled Beckmesser, finding the first drafts, asks, is this a biblical song? And Sox replies, you're missing a lot if you think just that. Right. Nothing in Die Meistersinger works on one level alone. When Walter conjures up more of his dream, his song turns New Testament. The words call to mind medieval representations of the Virgin Mary, with stars in her hair and suns in her eyes, born in grace, chosen as in a Magnificat. Why the Virgin Mary? Wagner was eventually to say that the real inspiration for Die Meistersinger was a painting of the Assumption, Mary taken up to heaven. In the Middle Ages, they loved to sing how the Ave in Ave Maria was the reverse of Eva. That is, how Mary, when she accepted the message of the angel, reversed the destructive process begun by Eve and began the whole process of redemption. They called Mary the new Eve. Through her came a redeeming from the flaw in human nature left by original sin. Ah, now we come to the heart of Die Meistersinger. Now we can see why baptism is so important a symbol in it. Baptism saves us from original sin, and the new song can save us from well, what would it be in Wagner's scheme of things that in traditional Christianity is original sin? Hans Sachs has the word for it. Von, that destructive streak, that mad streak that runs through human nature like some tragic flaw. Sachs wonders about it over his books in Act Three. He almost despairs over it. He hears it sounding in himself like an echo out of his soul, Vaughn, Vaughn. And then, in a great moment, he rises from his books, walks to his window, and the realization comes to him as morning light breaks over his city that that basic human instinct, Vaughn, need not be destructive. The whole destructive process can be reversed. Vaughn can be directed to creative ends, and that is what he proceeds to do. As Wagner composed his greatest works, he came again and again to the same profound realization. The flaw in our nature, the irrational, potentially destructive force within us, can also be powerfully creative, but it has to be directed it has to be, in the context of today's opera, baptized. It has to be, to use Wagner's own term, it has to be redeemed. And the great value of art, which itself arises out of that basic human drive, is that it can meet that inner compulsion to destroy and release its potential to create. Do you remember what Wagner called the home he built for himself in Bayreuth? Von Fried, peace from Von or better still, Vaughn used for peace. Wagner's critics are quick to object. 
How could Wagner sing about personal redemption and self-understanding when in his life he never knew them? But that, it seems to me, is why he wrote opera after opera about them. Out of the abundance of his intuitive genius and the abyss of his personal need, as Hans Sachs puts it, metaphorically of course, a songbird sings because he has to, and because he has to, he can. And so at the end of Meistersinger there comes a great cleansing baptism. The Vaughn that infected all the characters on St. John's Eve is washed away on the riverbank on St. John's Day. We in the audience rise from the long opera cleansed, baptized, purified, and the songbook that is Demeister Singer turns its last shining page.